So why don't we get us started? Um, so welcome to Effective Fundraising on a Shoestring. Um, we are here to learn from Jonathan. Jonathan is the development oh, director. Yeah, oh. <laughs> we have someone. Dora, I think you should mute yourself. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we are here today with Jonathan. Jonathan is the co-founder and development director of the Leadership Brainery. The Leadership Brainery is an organization that provides equitable access to graduate education. So um, it's a young organization uh, with a pretty strong track record for the five years that they've been in, in existence. And I'm more than excited to provide Jonathan uh, a platform to tell us how he did it all as the co-founder and um, development director. So our goal for today is to equip you, everyone, on this call with effective and tested strategies for your fundraising. Effective because Jonathan was able to raise $2 million in just five short years and tested because Jonathan is a practitioner. I'm also a practitioner. I used to be uh, the um, executive director of a small organization. I didn't have any fundraising staff, so I had to do it all on my own. Um, so we are here to learn. And the way we are going to do this is we're going to start with dispelling some fundraising myths. Um, I'm going to talk about some myths that in my mind and what I see in the work with my clients, I'm a fundraising consultant now, um, gets into the way all the time. And then we'll turn it over to Jonathan to hear his story and how he did it, how he was able to raise this amount of money. And um, then we'll get into the interview. As you remember, you submitted questions as part of your registration. And I aggregated them and have prepared some questions. But obviously, if you have any questions that tie into what Jonathan is saying or what I am, I am saying, um, feel free to ask your questions straight away and I'll take them as, as, as they come um, or as they fit into the flow of our conversation. So don't feel um, shy to, to ask any sort of questions that are on your mind. Just put them in the chat and at the end, we will also open it up to a free Q&A. So I, I imagine the transition will be kind of free flowing between the interview to get us started and the Q&A. All right. So um, why am I talking? Uh, who am I? My name is Anne. I am based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, just north of Boston. And as I just mentioned, I used to be an executive director myself. Um, I had several other stops on my career between being an executive director and today being a consultant for executive directors who don't have fundraising staff. Um, and what I do is um, I help with revenue diversification. Typically I work with organizations that are heavily based on government funding and I help create new revenue streams and establish a system that will make it easy and almost automatic for you to raise those unrestricted dollars because that's typically a problem with government funding. That's what I do. And on a personal note, I love podcasts. Um, whenever I have a free minute, I listen to a podcast, um, whether that's like Brene Brown or Tim Ferriss. I love everything personal development. And I actually have a newsletter where I share my kind of a highlight from the episodes that I listen to and translate or apply whatever I learned to fundraising. And I have a lot of fun doing that. And if you would like to sign up for my newsletter, um, I just put the link into the chat. Um, I, I just love sharing all those lessons and those great episodes from great thought leaders and researchers. So um, I'm always happy if, if more people can, can learn about um, all the great stuff that is out there. And also, of course, understand how it can be applied to fundraising. So that's who I am and why am I doing this uh, or why I am doing this. And I wanna know a little more about you all in this, um, in this room. So you already introduced yourselves in the chat, but it would be nice to see where you are in your um, fundraising journey. So um, we have three options. Um, are you at the base camp in your fundraising journey? That means you just started out, you're trying to get a lay of the land, you, you, you have the map out there, but you don't really know where to start yet. Or are you midway? 
um, on your journey. You had some challenges, you had some successes, but you still am always eager to learn learn more. You are still eager to learn more. Or are you at the summit? You have seen it all, you enjoy the view, and you're happy to help everyone else out. And the second question that I asked is, um, how old is or new is your organization? Are you less than one year in business or operation? Are you um, in the span of one to five years? Or have you been around for five plus years? OK, so it seems that participation slows down, is slowing down. OK, so let's look at the results. Um, sharing the results right now. Um, where are you in your fundraising journey? So we have a few, 10 of you, 10 out of 38 responses are at the base camp. They're just trying to get a lay of the land, understand where they're at and what they got themselves into. We have a few who say, or at least 66%. So the majority of folks in this room are midway. They understand the challenges. They understand what needs to be done, but there's always more to learn. There's still some, some way to go. And then we also have three folks of you who said they are already at the summit. They, they've seen it all and they're happy to give back and, and provide some perspective from where they're at. How old is your organization? So 80% of participants or 80% of the representation, the leaders in this room um, work for organizations or lead organizations that have been around for five plus years. All right, that gives us a good idea. And again, um, feel free to you know um, enter your email address, your your organization's website, your LinkedIn profile into the chat so that you can create some some connections in this room because I think it's it's incredibly important, especially when we are kind of the solo practitioners in this role. It's incredibly important that we have that sort of community around us that can support us. All right, good. So let's get started with the fundraising myths. Um, so these myths are, in my mind, uh, really important to dispel because they um, they get into the way of being successful at fundraising all the time. Um, and the first myth I want to spell out is, if we build it, they will come. So the number one question that I get by far is, or the number one issue that folks raise um, when you know they approach me, they say, we need more donors. And the number one response or answer that I give is, well, have you told them about your cause? Hmm. Have you looked for them? Do you know where they are? Are you promoting your organization in the places where your donors are? And oftentimes the answer is, well, I don't know, or maybe, but I'm not so sure. And that's why I put this image of an empty auditorium or empty movie theater. If you don't tell people who you are, what you do, why it's relevant, and if you don't promote yourself, you know, this, we are all in it because we believe in the cause, right? Because we want to do good in the world. But a lot of nonprofit management and fundraising is also about operating like a business and business means we need to market and promote ourselves because we can do the best work in the world if nobody knows about it we cannot raise any money so just building it and assuming only because we do great work is going to attract donors is unfortunately not true so marketing and communications are not a nice to have they are essential for you to raise funds the second myth that I come across quite often is that fundraising is about money. And honestly, you know, none of us got into fundraising because we always wanted to do fundraising. And of course, the first idea that we have about fundraising is that it's about money because that's that's what we see when we grow up, right? And nobody has a real understanding about fundraising because you don't go to school for fundraising. And I definitely believe that. And I did not want to have anything to do with money and fundraising for that matter for a very long time until I understood that fundraising is about relationships. And you all heard that before, right? Fundraising is about relationships. And once you understand that, you can get 
out of the anxiety zone and focus on what truly moves the needle in your fundraising. And everything, I mean, Jonathan and I will probably talk about it, everything flows from the mindset, the way you see things. And if you see fundraising not about money, but about relationships, you will be way more successful than having this, you know, I mean, I've been there too, right? So having this icky feeling, oh my God, I need to ask someone for money. No, that's not what you do. You tell someone about the great work that you're doing and why why someone should support that. That's what you do. Um, so that's myth number two, which I often see gets into the way. And then myth number three, and that's what I especially see with very young organizations, is that they believe that there is some sort of shortcut, right? So uh, what I mean with that is we just need to find that event format which is going to work for us. And that is going to bring in the 10,000 of, of dollars or 100,000 of dollars. Um, or, you know, there is just something that we missed. We, we didn't get the memo on how to do this. We just missed it. But the truth is, it's all about consistency. So that's why I put this picture of a runner. If you ever trained or if you have ever played any sports, you know, it's all about consistency, right? It's not that you go for a run once and then you run a marathon, right? It, this is not how it works. You need to put consistent effort in it in order to get better. And you, you know, just with training for a marathon, you go for longer and longer runs. You evaluate whether what you're doing is working, whether you are able to, to run longer distances, you adjust your diet. And likewise with fundraising, you build relationships, you, um, you get better at communicating your cause. We talked about it just before, right? Communication is so essential. Um, so there is no shortcut. It is a long game and you have to play the game if you wanna be successful. You cannot run a marathon if you go for a 5K run around the neighborhood once. It's not gonna work like that. There is no shortcut. It's diligent, persistent action. That's what fundraising is about. So to sum this up, um, before I hand it over to Jonathan, is um, fundraising success is basically these three things. You need to promote yourself. People need to know about you and your cause. You need to focus on relationships. And you need to be consistent and persistent. I couldn't decide, should I say consistent and persistent? It's the same thing. You need to be consistent and persistent. You need to, need to do the same thing, adjust the thing that you're doing and persist on doing the thing, which is building relationships, promoting your organization, telling people that you're out there and that, that you're doing great work. So that's fundraising success in a nutshell. Um, but we um, want to hear from someone who did it themselves, right? Um, we want to hear from the practitioner, not the textbook version of how you should do it. And we want to understand what does that all mean? Like, how do you promote? And what, what does that mean, building a relationship, right? And that's why I would like to hand it over to Jonathan now to tell us a little more about you and also about the Leadership Brainery, because this is a really great organization that, frankly, everyone should know about. Um, all right, so take it away, Jonathan. Tell us a bit more about yourself. Well, first and foremost, thank you, Anne, for the invitation, for your leadership, for being a trailblazer um, in fundraising, in philanthropy, and in, in change making, um, and for inviting me to um, come be a part of this community um, today and to share not only my own story, but um, the journey that we're on at Leadership Brainery to increase access to master's and doctoral degrees for underrepresented communities, as we believe it as one of the accelerated pathways to management and senior leadership in the workforce. And we believe it's important because um, this is necessary to help close wealth gaps in our country. Um, if you can't tell by my accent, I'm originally from Texas and moved up to Boston um, eight years ago in 2017, um, in 2016 to be exact, actually. The time has moved by really fast and it's quite amazing uh, to think about what we've accomplished at Leadership Brainery and now um, the last five years as a formal nonprofit organization. Uh, we initially began doing our work um, straight out of, um, in and out of undergrad at Grambling State University, a historically black college and university in North Louisiana. Um, myself and my co-founder and partner, Derek Young Jr., who is also our executive director here at Leadership Brainery, um, we were very active student leaders um, at Grambling 
and started getting calls from different student government presidents saying, hey, how are y'all getting so much done on your campus um, and working so well with your administration, making impact, and uh, the word is getting out about y'all. So we started providing leadership development trainings and consulting to student organizations at different colleges and universities 10 years ago in 2013. Um, and uh, after going to graduate school ourselves, we looked around and we were the few Black men in our respective graduate school programs. Um, Deer came up to Boston first and, and in his Master's of Public Health program was the only Black man in his cohort. Um, and I came up for law school in 2017 and out of 200, uh, 26 things are and out of 250 students um, was one out of four Black men. Um, and we started looking around and saying, wait, why are there not more people like us from our backgrounds in these competitive graduate school programs? Because we know the connection that it has to management and senior leadership roles in the workforce. Um, we know the connection it has um, to advanced career mobility um, and greater um, income opportunity, and even influence leadership opportunities in our communities. Um, and we started asking admissions um, that question. They said, well, we can't find enough qualified diverse candidates. So we were like, okay. So we asked the question to, the co companies and they would say the same thing. And we didn't think it was the most innovative response. While we understand that recruitment is not um, the easiest um, task for any organization or institution, um, the reality is there, there's tons of um, intelligent, brilliant individuals who are coming from underrepresented communities, that's communities of color, lower income backgrounds, maybe they're part of families where they're the first in their families to go to college who simply are lacking the resources, lacking the motivation, uh, particularly encouragement, um, but also the connections to the opportunities and also the resources, especially when we think about um, the weight that financial um, barriers have on accessing um, graduate level education, even undergraduate education. Um, and so we want, wanted to do something about it. And so we decided to transform what we were doing from leadership development consulting um, to um, developing a nonprofit organization in 2018 that focused on providing the resources, the support, the connections for the graduate school admissions process. Um, we now, um, two weeks ago, celebrated our fifth year birthday. Um, and I'm just so blown away to think about over the last five years, we've raised nearly $2 million um, to invest in this work. Um, we do not come from a background of wealth. And so um, to think about the fact that means that we also have built a network and a movement around this in just a very short time. We have over 700 individuals um, who have personally invested in our work, um, a growing number of graduate schools um, that are partnering with us, um, as well as a growing number of companies, as well as foundations that are beginning to support us. Um, we can get into the nuances of some of the challenges we've experienced um, along the way, but I'm giving you high level overview and, and celebratory anecdotes um, uh, to kick us off um, in particular. Our team is growing. Um, we now have a team of five full-time staff members um, and um, a part-time fundraising fellow um, as well. Um, my um, development manager, Yolanda, um, is on, on the call today. So y'all show Yolanda some love um, as well. And we are working hard and diligently uh, to drive this work forward um, at Leadership Brainery. Our students are killing the game. Um, I'm just so grateful um, to see how in their own respect Effective fields. Um, they're making so much impact in their communities, um, even within on their college campuses, but also in their respective careers, career fields as well. Um, we are um, just getting started, to say the least. Um, and uh, I'm really excited about where leadership right is headed. Um, I'll stop there um, so that Ian, you can take us forward um, as we dive into the conversation a little bit more. But I'm so grateful to be here. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that overview. And uh, it's, it's, it's always great to speak to you and uh, hear your enthusiasm for this work. Um, so I'm curious, um, what do you enjoy about fundraising or how did it happen that you became the development director? Is that something that you, you, know, you thought was in the cards for you or how did that happen? Because it's, you know, again, nobody goes to school for fundraising, right? Um, so how, how did you create that path? You know, I think most people could probably relate that 
fundraising just happens to you uh, quite often. Um, I mean, unless you just one of those people, um, but I don't really meet those type of people often who always dreamed of being a fundraiser. Um, and so it, it kind of is a calling if I say anything and, you know, just a little more background about me. I, I grew up as a childhood preacher. I have a master's in theological studies. So, so I think very intentionally and very deeply about people, um, about what we believe in and how that influences how we navigate the world. Um, and so I, I do believe that people who are doing um, fundraising work um, are called to it. Somehow they, they, they get there. And oftentimes it's a mixture of personality traits, um, convictions, um, even, um, and, and obviously characteristics, and sometimes just being in the right place at the right time, um, or depending on how you frame it, being in the wrong place at the right time, one of, one of the other, um, um, but uh, fundraising can be both a blessing and a curse. The curse is more so the pressure um, that you take on for the, the, the livelihood of the organization and obviously of your teammates. Um, it is not an easy feat, but it's one that I'm so deeply grateful that I get to do, right? That's why I call it a calling. Um, Cause I, I, it's a blessing and a privilege um, to be a fundraiser, to have the responsibility um, of ensuring the sustainability of a cause and of a mission of an organization. And that's what we get to do at LB. How did I become development director? Well, I'm co-founder um, and Derek is my co-founder and he's our executive director. And so while one of us is focused on, on the, you know, the day-to-day -day operations, somebody had to focus on um, raising the money and um, that happens to be me. Um, what I will say is before um, I came on as the rep um, to focus on the development at Leadership Brainery. I did run for city council to represent Austin Brighton. Um, and uh, anybody know anything about political fundraising um, or even running for office, um, you know, fundraising is very, very key um, to any campaign. Um, and so I definitely had a lot of experience in the, um, my run for city council raising money. Um, and, uh, you know, experience a mindset shift. Had I not ran for city council, I don't know if I would have been so confident to take on the development director role. And one of the mindset shifts that I experienced when running for office um, was um, changing the way I was thinking about raising money for me um, to really, you know, energizing uh, myself and my community to understand that the money that I was raising was for the cause and the platform um, and the mission that I wanted to put forward. Um, and, and I've carried that mentality on, on over through my work here at Leadership Brainery um, to not, sometimes we get in our own heads and we, we get very insecure about asking for money because oftentimes we're thinking about, will this person say yes to me? Does this person want to give to me? But I had to check myself and say, wait, this isn't about you. This is about the cause. This is about the impact that you want to make. Um, and so uh, to be able to bring that same mentality over into what we're doing at LB, I think has been game changing um, that we realize that we're building a movement and there's so many people um, who are invested in wanting to see our communities be uplifted um, to create more innovative solutions to our most pressing problems. And now more than ever, we're talking about wealth inequity um, and how um, graduate education is a gateway to helping um, for, um, further our efforts to closing wealth gaps um, in this country. And so that is the movement that we're building. Um, and that is why people are giving to Leadership Brainery. And I'm just so um, grateful to only be a vehicle um, in which um, we're driving that work forward. And obviously, alongside Yolanda and Derek um, and the rest of the team, because one thing that we're telling our team every single day um, is um, working to train all of us on the role that we all play. Um, in our fundraising efforts at Leadership Brandery. It's not only the people who have a designated title um, for development and fundraising, um, but every single individual at Leadership Brandery is, um, plays a very critical role in driving um, our mission forward and therefore have a key responsibility in helping us strengthen our fundraising efforts at Leadership Brandery. So that's how I got into it, Ann. Um, you know, it, it kind of happened to me. I love that. Thank you so much. I'm taking so many notes because I think there are so many ideas that you just conveyed that we could, uh, you know, tie into in, in our conversation. Um, so what I love most um, are basically two things. Um, so um, the way you frame fundraising, and I think that's how fundraising should always be framed, 
is that it's part of the mission. It advances the mission, not only because it provides the funding, but the activity or the very action of raising funds is part of the mission because it communicates an idea and your cause, right? So I, I really like that, that, like that perspective on fundraising. And, and that's also, you know, what seems to give you so, so much of the satisfaction of being able to do that. Work. You, you literally say, it's not something that, you know, someone has to do it. It's like, that's what you really want to do. And that's, that's what gives you joy. And, you know, and it's been a work in pro progress um, over time. You know, you know, I have those moments where I have to remind myself why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, especially the moments when it gets tough and I'm discouraged or that gift is committed, but it doesn't come through. Or they say that they're going to give a certain amount, but they give less than that. And then you're starting to, you know, you know, beat yourself up um, about um, your goals and your outcomes. Um, and you have to take a moment and say, wait, why am I here again? Um, and you have to allow that to feed you to move you forward. And so, you know, even when you mentioned earlier that fundraising is about isn't about money. Um, I think that's so important. And, you know, there are conversations that I have with some of our supporters um, where I have to tell them, you know what, I actually wish I did not have to ask you for money. But I do not prefer to be running around asking people for money. That is not what I desire. That is not what gives me a thrill in life. Um, I, I wish um, that the money was already there. Um, I wish that I was born to a very wealthy family and that that's how um, we could have started this work, but that's not my story. Um, and that's not the reality. And so the money is just a necessity. Um, it, it is just what comes with the territory. I mean, so even as I thought about what you were saying earlier about fundraising not being about money, I agree with that. Um, and, and would also state, um, but it's about outcomes and a cause, right? Um, and we build relationships to generate resources to make the impact. Right. So it's not about money. It's about the cause. Um, and it is relationships that we build to be able to give us the resources that we need to make the impact that we want to make. Um, and so the relationships are, you know, a, a proxy to that. Um, and that's how we generate what we need to get the work done. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. And um, what I also hear is that basically what made you a great fundraiser is, of course, believing in the cause but also lots of transferable skills. And um, I think that's also a very important perspective because um, fundraising in its essence is really not a rocket science. It goes back to very simple principles like you know, connection, emotion, that's what drives fundraising, right? So it's not, a, it's not rocket science. Um, and so I'm wondering um, what sort of skills or mindsets are helping you in being really good at what you're doing? Very good question. You know, you know, first and foremost, as you already stated, consistency is key, um, right? Um, getting to the point where you're doing certain activities over and over and over again, and that's everything from newsletters to um, you know, acknowledging donors when they do give has become a very important thing that we've had to continue to um, develop our consistency around being persistent i think is really key we would not have raised what we've raised to date and we won't raise what we will raise in the future if we give up first and foremost you will never reach a goal if you give up on it first and foremost um and i think that is being the number one um skill set the number one um factor that has contributed to where we are today is persistence um, because the work is hard. It's not easy, especially when you're building something from scratch. Some of y'all have the privilege of being development um, professionals at organizations that already had a coffer when you came in, already had donors and a giving track record and database that you were able to just kind of jump in, leverage, cultivate, and keep going. And that's such a privilege, and you should be so grateful. Um, and then there's so, so many, and I'm not saying that made, you know, that makes your life easy. I'm not saying that. Um, I can definitely empathize that the work is still um, a, a drilling um, and very um, you know, long-term process. And then I also want to speak to those of you who, like me, literally started your development offices from scratch. You didn't have the resources. You didn't have the mentors. Um, and a lot of what you've experienced was by trial and error. It was by doing, by trying. Um, and, and to that extent, persistence has been very um, game-changing for us. But also something that's been has been flexibility. 
Um, and, and we've had to learn that. Um, you know, a lot of times you have goals, you have plans and you want to stick to it. You want to do things a certain way, but you also have to be willing to change and evolve. Um, there is a entrepreneur um, named John Henry that talks about the importance of not suffocating um, your vision. I mean, when you're starting something from scratch, you have a vision. And once that thing gets started, it starts teaching you new lessons. You start learning that, oh, well, you know, this snail mail has... Um, whatever effect that it that it has is going to be effective to whatever degree or percentage. Um, emails are going to have whatever um, degree of effectiveness it might have. Um, text messages as well as uh, phone calls have a, a degree and level of effectiveness. And then you start learning which pockets and which areas um, and strategies are going to be the most effective for the audiences and different segments that you work with. And then once you learn those antidotes and those lessons, then you then determine, okay, well, we have to pivot this way or evolve this way, or we're listening to our donors and they're saying, this is why they give. It's not the reason why we thought that they were giving. And so we know to then transform some of our messaging to focus on some of these key areas. Or we realize that you know some of our donors um, give via different avenues, whether that's check, um, online giving, um, some of them are giving via stock. Some of them are giving via donor advised funds. And so we've had to then learn how to set up an endowment account so we can accept stock giving. And so it's a constant evolution and you have to be willing to be flexible and evolve and not beat yourself up along the way when things don't go the way that you want them to go. Um, those have been some of the key um, antidotes um, and skill sets that we've had to develop. And I'll lastly say innovation innovate, 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 and at Leadership Brainery, not only um, are we driven and passionate about our cause, but I'm proud that our development team is working to be uh, one of the best in the field, um, one of the world world leading um, development um, teams to do this work. Why? And that's because we are prioritizing innovation at the forefront of every, everything that we do, um, which is why I'm proud that the Massachusetts Nonprofit Network um, named us among um, um, the finalists and honored us at the State House last week um, in the innovation track um, for our work. We could have been recognized in the education pillar or the small nonprofit pillar, but we were honored as a finalist in the innovation category. And I think in addition to the innovation of our programs and our mission inherently, and I also think it's been the way in which we've been building a movement um, around our work and receiving unprecedented support um, in line with that as well. Thank you. Uh, great, great learnings. Um, and I think it's so valuable to hear it from you rather than from someone, you know, from a textbook. And it just shows that there is no one size fits all, right? You know, it all goes back to principles, which are kind of universal, like relationships work, proximity is a factor and so on. Um, but at the, in the end, you need to understand for your organization, what is the most effective way to fundraise? And you need to continuously evolve, innovate, and test, um, and learn from, from what you learn, learn from your data. That's so important. Um, that actually, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll keep that, my, that question for, for later, but um, you mentioned, you know, um, it's important for you to, to, um, to support those, of course, that's why we are here today, to, to learn effective strategies, right? Um, and especially for those who don't have development functions and maybe not a lot of resources. So basically where you started from. So what recommendation or what would you do if you had to do it from scratch? Or um, um, a question I asked you, um, you know, in the pre-interview, so to say, is what would you do if you had to do it in just one year? So what's the essence? Like what's the really key things that you need to focus on? Um, if you want to raise funds? I really appreciate this question, and because I think it, and as we, we had this same conversation, I think it boils down to time, right? Because you just asked me, we've raised nearly $2 million in five years, so if I needed to raise nearly $2 million in one year, what would I do? Um, well, the first response that I haven't done that yet um, to be very clear, um, but we're on our way. And what would I do? Um, I think the first thing that I responded to you that I think is really important is this question is about time at the end of the day. That's that's one of the key distinctions um, between what we've been able to do in five years versus uh, what we could do in one year. And time is always of the essence and one of the most 
pressing factors in our in our roles as fundraising um, professionals, right? And uh, most of the time, we don't feel like we have enough time. Um, and the reality is, we don't have enough time. And so, what do you do when you don't have enough time? And I, I have this concept um, that I've coined um, called trust by proxy, right? If fundraising is a lot about relationship building and you don't have enough time because relationship building is also about trust, right? That's how you strengthen a relationship is by building trust. But if you don't have enough time to build trust, how do you get somebody that you don't know to trust you? Well, it's by proxy of another relationship that they already have invested trust in that you can then leverage to expedite the process um, by which you two build trust um, between one another. And oftentimes, I mean, many of you can relate to this, it's by somebody making an introduction to somebody else in their network who they already know. And when you then start building a relationship with that person they've introduced you to, you are building your relationship off of the trust that they've already formed with the person that made the introduction. And so that is what you need to leverage when you don't have a lot of time. Um, you, it's time to network. It's time to leverage the people that you already know and ask them to connect you to the people in their network who they know. And at Leadership Brain, a thing that we use is peer-to-peer -peer fundraising um, to do this. That's one angle that we use, peer-to-peer um, -peer fundraising. Um, and technology has played a major role in how we um, leverage peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So we have an online platform um, that we set up a campaign and then individuals in the Leadership Brainery Network and then go and set up their own individual fundraising pages that contributes to that larger goal. Um, but they also have their own personal fundraising pages that they can customize. Um, we set up a lot of the language and uh, collateral for them. So it makes it easy for the most part, but each donor, each fundraiser can get as creative and personalized as they want um, in terms of how they customize their own pages. They then reach out to their own networks, their own circles, and say how passionate they are about the work that Leadership Brainery is doing, what their connection might be to it, and then they call their community, their network um, to action and to get involved, and then we raise money. And that has been game-changing for Leadership Brainery. Um, that has particularly contributed to the amount of individual donors that we've grossed in the last um, two years particularly. Um, we have seen nearly 400 new donors enter into the Leadership Brainery supporter fold um, via connections by proxy, trust by proxy, um, which has been um, tremendous. But we've also leveraged this same approach with major donors. Um, individuals who have given more significantly, uh, more significant contributions, who've then introduced us to um, people in that network who could give um, similar size gifts. And I would say that our board has been a very strategic partner in our peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, and especially this idea of trust by proxy, um, where um, they've introduced us to key people in their networks um, who have been game-changing uh, for the organization. Um, so that is what I'd say, Ian, um, is a first step in what you do. Obviously, I would encourage you to look at who has already contributed to your organization in the past, cultivate those relationships deeper, um, build opportunities in whereby you can get to know them more and they can get to know you more, update them on how their investment has already made an impact. Um, toward your organization and the mission and what greater investment um, could yield. Um, so always think about how you can take the individuals and the people that are already invested in you and how you can make a case for them to dig deeper, give more um, than they've given before. It's always great um, for people to reinvest at the same level that they've given, but it's even greater um, when they can see the need um, and build the confidence to dig deeper and give even more to your organization. So a mixture of those different trends um, or approaches, I think, um, are always important, especially when time is of the essence. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's awesome. Um, so I wanted to underline two things that you said. Um, so first of all, relationships. So I think something that I did not quite understand when I was new in fundraising was, okay, so fundraising is about relationships, but what does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. And I think you, you, made a really good case right now what you know how to go about building a relationship and I think the peer-to-peer -peer 
aspect is very, very important, especially if you don't have a big donor database yet, or if, you know, if you're looking to expand your donor database because, and trust by proxy, right? So who do you know who can make introductions and um, who is basically the most visible or the, the person with the largest audience whose trust you can borrow in one way or another, whose trust, but also whose visibility, right? So yeah. I like that, that um, the peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and how that works. It's basically also the concept of fundraising from the inside out. You start mm -hmm. for you, but then you build on that, right? So you, you, you use those to, to make more introductions and so on. And the second aspect, which I want to highlight is and that ties into that is that you said you leverage technology. And that goes back to what you said earlier, right? About evaluation and constantly innovating and testing and seeing what works and what doesn't work. If you don't collect data on what works and what doesn't work, you will never find out. You will be constantly in this hamster wheel in this you know, groundhog day where you try to find that new fundraising hack or a new event format that, that will give you the dollars. But if you have a system, and that can be a CRM, as you said, or you know, a platform, a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising platform, if you are able to collect data on what works and what doesn't work, that's what's going to um, bring you forward um, very fast. Um, so I want to remind you all on this call to please put your questions in the chat if you have any um, as we're going along. But I think this is a is a very you know engaging conversation. So um, and you don't have to ask any questions. Um, so something that I know that folks are usually very curious about, and we had a few questions around that, is the role of the board, because you just touched on that as well. And so how did you go about building your board or engaging your board in fundraising? I think that is a very, very important aspect. Yeah, I, I really appreciate this question, because I think it's probably one of the most difficult um, aspects of building any organization and, and fundraising is your board. And we're still on a, traje uh, a trajectory, a evolution um, pathway as it relates to building our board. But we're very grateful for our board um, who, who've stepped in um, and, and have been doing tremendous work um, to continue to learn how to be um, a strong board themselves, which is really important. But one of the things that we got advice on first was starting um, that was really important is to ensure that we had a board that understood that fundraising was expected of them. Um, and, you know, we had an instance where one of our um, board members, um, you know, didn't quite get that. And, and we had to have like really important conversations about the importance of, of fundraising um, to be a part of the board. And so what we had to create was a give a get. Um, and so to be on our board, you have to commit um, to either giving a certain amount, which for us, our give a get is currently, um, this is 2023, just dating it um, for people who may watch this in years to come. Um, it, we have a $5,000 give a get currently. So you have to either contribute 5,000 yourself um, or you can fundraise it. And there are plenty of opportunities um, that you can leverage at Leadership Brainery to fundraise. The Our annual Change Can't Wait campaign, um, which happens, um, which is our annual giving fund. Um, we also have um, our um, summit and soiree, which we leverage a lot of corporate sponsorships around. And we have board members who are connected to institutions and companies um, that they're able to leverage um, to, to meet their goals that way. People are able to host their own individual house parties. One of our board members hosted one the other week um, that raised nearly $10,000. Um, that was phenomenal. Um, and we just, this was our first time testing the house party model. Um, so. We feel like it works. And so we're now we're about to press go on doing it even more, doing it better. Um, and uh, another thing that's been really um, key is um, finding ways um, to really be strategic um, with our board. And so, for example, um, every year for the Change Can't Wait campaign, our board puts up a matching gift um, that we're then able to leverage um, to drive more momentum around the Change Can't Wait campaign. Um, that that has been some ways in which we've activated. But I think something that a lot of people fail at um, that we're learning to be more diligent around is to not forget to cultivate your board, right? 
a lot of times we say, oh, they've signed up, they're on the board, we're good to go, we have no more work to do with them. And that's not the truth. Um, you must treat your board members like you treat any other funders, any other investors, any other stakeholders as it relates to needing to constantly educate them on the mission. Don't take for granted that because they signed up to be on your board that they truly understand your mission through and through. And I know it sounds counterintuitive because you think that because somebody committed to the board that they must have, they understand the ins and outs. It's not true. Um, people are busy. Um, um, oftentimes they say yes to your board is because they are compelled by the mission, but it's not often and always because they know everything about the mission um, and everything about the organization and how it's going about doing its work. And so you have to constantly be working to cultivate and educate your board on the work that you're doing, um, but also motivating your board. One thing that I've seen with our board at times is some people are nervous about fundraising. Um, maybe it's their first time fundraising. Um, maybe they um, they took a stab at it and didn't get the responses um, that they thought they were going to get. We had a board member last year um, that set a really ambitious fundraising goal and didn't get anywhere near it and was a bit discouraged by that. Um, and that happens. You know, We set goals <laughs> that we don't reach um, all the time and it is discouraging. Um, so you gotta also be um, uh, attentive to your board members, to the things that they're experiencing as they're supporting the organization and helping them understand and contextualize better um, um, the work that we're doing and how they can do the work better. And so even with that board member is going back and say, okay, well, show me what you did. Um, show me the message that you sent out. Um, did you follow up? Did you only send it once um, or were you consistent um, in your outreach? Um, did you diversify your outreach? Was it only email or did you throw some text messages out there? Um, did you schedule some lunches and some dinners with some of your friends that you're close with so that you can have some more private time, intimate time to dive deeper with them? Um, did you make an introduction to us, to the team? So maybe we could take it further and dig deeper and give more information to, to those individuals. Um, and so you have to constantly be cultivating your board, motivating your board, um, and educating your board along the way as well. Hmm. I think that that is really like a textbook example, how you build your board and, um, you know, are intentional about the give get, which the really absolute minority of organizations, especially younger organizations are. So, there was a lot of hesitation around um, fundraising or the gift get, right? So basically um, expecting and making that expectation very clear from the beginning. If you join our board, we expect you to either contribute personally or leverage your network to bring in a certain amount of um, money. And I mean, uh, it doesn't have to be at a, at a set amount, right? I think as far as that I understand you, you have a set amount. It can also be, you know, to open up the, opportunities to like maybe for folks who are really not connected and who really you know are unable to to even consider such an amount or even if they're able to maybe they just cannot conceptualize how that would be possible because they're new to fundraising so to open up that avenue you can also leave the give get open right that's an option but of course i mean i can imagine that if you, if you have your give get at, at such an at, at such an amount right that is actually a considerable source of revenue for you and builds that sort of um, movement, as you said, right? The introductions and all that. So that's- Yeah, we, that's we considered it a way of building your giving muscle, right? And, and people, just like you go and you exercise, you work out to build, um, to build up it, you have to build your giving muscle. And, you know, there are different types of boards. And I think it's also important for you to understand what type of board you have. Like if, if you don't need a fundraising board, because you have all of the resources already, then you know maybe the give and get is not applicable to you and your organization. And maybe you have more of a working board where what you need more are volunteers and people who can step in and do more programmatic and operational type work with your organization. And if that's the case, it's important that you identify that, know that, um, and you know don't be pressed um, by the other board formats. Um, but if you're in a position where you need resources and fundraising, is one of the top priorities for your organization, then you don't need a board where all they do is give you advice the whole time because you can get advice from people um, without them being on your board. I think it's important that you understand um, that people have advisory boards um, um, for those that just want advice. Um, you know, we have advisors who aren't on 
any kind of board, but we can call them up and reach out to them if we have questions and we need their feedback. Um, so you just need to contextualize things um, and truly understand what is my board? Why do I have a board? Um, and, and, and then move forward with determining who needs to be on my board. Elizabeth Abell at um, CSS Fundraising, um, I love um, this um, framing that she has about board selection. And she says, you wanna find people who have the affinity, the ability, and the access. The affinity, the ability, and the access as it relates to building a board. And, we, and we've taken that, um, that model and we've been running with it at Leadership Brandon. So thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, that's, that's very important. Um, and that's the three A's of fundraising. Um, so you can even Google that, you will find it. Um, so, I mean, audience saying the audience, right? Um, so we do have a few questions in the chat and, and like we only have eight minutes left. So, um, so Abin Bolas asks, how do you get persistent with donors and they won't feel that you're pressurizing them? So basically mm -hmm. a balance of asking, but also giving, how do you, how do you do that? Um, I think that it, this is where we go back to the conversation about relationship building. First of all, it is difficult and it's something I'm trying to you know, think about all the time, how not to create donor fatigue, um, so to speak. And it is difficult because the reality is we need the resources. Um, and, you know, when you have a limited pool of donors to, to depend on, you know, you kind of got to go back to them. Because I think one of the catches is sometimes people don't, raise enough from their donors because they don't ask enough. Um, and so you you, you kind of got to strike the right balance and not being one of those organizations that fail to ask. Um, and quite often, um, that's the case with folk. Um, but how not to ask too much, I think, goes back to the importance of building trust and building a relationship. It is the long haul game. So even the question that you asked me earlier about, but what if you only have one year to do this? Um, I think the framing that you must understand that even when you have a goal within a given year, understand that whatever you do within that year is only the building blocks for the years to come, right? So yeah, you plan to raise, for example, a million dollars in 2023. Um, if or if you don't raise that amount, you still must understand that whatever outcome you come to, that that is only um, the building block and the foundation for what will happen next year. And you can exponentially evolve and grow in the following year. So that's why you cannot give up. That's why you must be persistent. Uh, but this is a relationship building game. And so honestly, I'm not the type of person um, that always follows this step-by-step -step process when it comes to relationship building. And the reason why is because every person is different and thereby every relationship it's going to be different. And so you have to spend time getting to know those people individually. Um, and so I try to hold fast to certain principles. One of them is authentic connection, right? Being myself always. I don't put on a face. I don't put on a show for nobody. I'm always trying to be my most authentic self um, because if you can, if you don't connect with who I am authentically, this won't be a sustainable relationship because I can only fake it for so long. So I need you to be connected and authentically convinced by who I am at my real estate stage. Um, and that's what you're getting even right now, right? And then um, you got to explore synergies. Um, that's going to be really important, um, exploring the synergies. You have to get to know those people, know more about them, know more about their backgrounds, so you can be able to better align um, where the connection is between the work that you're doing and who they are um, in their personal and professional lives. Um, and that comes by literally organic engagement. Sometimes I'll text my, my supporters just to say, how are you doing today? Or I may know it's their birthday. And so I'll hit them up and say, happy birthday. Um, or if there is some, um, some success that we experienced at Leadership Brainery that I think they should know about, I'll send them a quick message and say, hey, did you see this? Or, hey, watch this. One of our students just accomplished this. We just had a White House, our first White House intern come through Leadership Brandon. So certain donors who I think may be very excited about that or connected or to that, I'll share that with them. Um, if there's a personal life update that I might have that has nothing to do with leadership brainery, sometimes I share those type of updates as well. And so you have to spend time getting to know them. I mean, I have donors that I go and get drinks with. I have donors I have lunch and dinner with. I have donors that invite me to their homes and I meet their families and I get to know their kids. Um, and we build um, really 
authentic engagements. I have donors who get to know some of my students and the relationship is actually fostered um, through students that are coming through our programs and they come back and tell us how amazing it was mentoring one of our students. And so you got to get creative friends um, and you got to pull out oftentimes all of the stops as it relates to relationship building. And then lastly, I'll say that you must be insistent on igniting the urgency, right? Building the movement is what's necessary. And so we're very consistent on igniting the urgency, always sharing with our supporters why their support has been important and why it still is important and why it's going to become even more important as we persist. For example, the Supreme Court is getting ready to announce whether or not it will overturn affirmative action for leadership brainery. That is a very timely and important issue. So we're working at the forefront of doing thought leadership around that, educating our supporters about the importance of it um, and doing what we can uh, to help educate the community about why, about why leadership brainery is more timely um, and more important now than ever. Yeah, thank you for this empathetic uh, um, highlight of, of uh, how to balance that I don't want to say dichotomy, but you know how to build an effective relationship, right? Or um, you know the balance between providing updates and keeping donors engaged and involved in the cause, but also of course then asking every so often um, for support so that you can do this work in the first place. It's so key. And Ian, let me just throw, um, add one more thing that I think is really important. Um, I think it's important that everyone, if you are a fundraising professional, that you be intentional on building a personal and professional brand. Um, th there is much opportunity that will come your way, not because you went out and sought after it, not because you know the person, but because they happen to be on LinkedIn and they happen to see an update about the important work that you were doing. And they decided to reach out and say, I love what you're doing. Um, Want to get involved. Let me know how I can make a contribution or how I can introduce and connect some people to the work that you're doing. And so it is not good. If you are a fundraiser and you do not have a brand yourself, not only the organization and the company that you're working for, but you as the fundraiser, you must have a personal and professional brand. And if you have not been spending time developing your personal brand, um, beefing up that LinkedIn, um, being on other social media platforms, going to networking events, um, showing up to webinars like this and leveraging um, your own expertise and experiences, that's only gonna make it more difficult for you to fundraise. People need to know who you are. You want to build the type of dynamic to where support is flooding in, right? And the only way you're gonna really get to that point is if people are hearing about you without you having to reach out to them directly. That's a great perspective, I love that. Um, all right, so um, we do have two, three more questions in the chat and um, Feel free to just follow up with me personally if you want um, to um, have your answers uh, questions answered. I'm sure Jonathan is also um, open to answering questions via LinkedIn. He put his um, his profile in the chat earlier on. So um, I want to briefly wrap it up with um, this slide because I think we talked a lot about the concepts that I I, I started out with, right? So fundraising in a nutshell, um, you just spoke about it um, as your last speaking point, right? Promote your cause. How do you promote your cause? You can also promote yourself. You build a brand about yourself because um, around yourself, especially as a founder, because most of the times you're gonna be very passionate about your work and um, what you do and um, where you raise funds for um, is gonna be part of what you're passionate about, right? So. Um, building that audience, uh, promoting your cause, very important. Focus on relationships. I think that's what we uh, spend the most time talking about. Trust by proxy, a very important concept. And lastly, um, least but not last, last but not least, be consistent. So leverage technology. Um, make sure that you track data and make sure that you know what works and what doesn't work. So with that being said, um, last slide. So if you need any help, feel free to um, reach out to me. I'm happy to help you with um, raising more money, even if you don't have development staff. If you want to diversify your funding um, 
uh, funding streams. Um, that's what I'm here for. And I'm gonna put my link um, to book a, a call in, in the notes, uh, sorry, in the chat. And with that being said, uh, I, I hate keep, keeping people on the call for longer than necessary. I thank you very much um, for your active participation. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for joining us today. Thank you and so much. I, a lot of good things will come out of this call. Yes, wishing everybody well. Thank you, Anne. Um, the best is yet to come, my friends. I hope to connect on LinkedIn and beyond. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.